Chapter 1. The Early Years The large, elegant house of the Roosevelts stood tall in Hyde Park, New York. Birds chirped, the sun shone bright, and the servants were bustling with excitement. A baby's cry echoed through the hallways. Young Franklin had arrived. As Franklin grew, the house was filled with toys fit for a prince. There were handmade wooden toys, imported dolls, and even a small train set. Every evening, the family would gather in the grand dining room, beneath the golden chandelier. The room would echo with laughter and the clinking of fine china. Yet, amidst this luxury, young Franklin often felt alone. His parents, though loving, had high expectations. Stand tall, Franklin, his father would say, adjusting Franklin's posture. A Roosevelt must always be dignified. He would nod, but in his heart, a storm brewed. He didn't just want to be a Roosevelt. He wanted to be Franklin, a boy with dreams, passions, and mischief. One evening, as the family sat for dinner, Franklin spilled his glass of juice. The liquid spread quickly, staining the white tablecloth. The room grew silent. He could feel his cheeks turning red, and his heart pounded loudly in his ears. His mother's eyes were kind but sad. It's okay, dear, she whispered, but Franklin knew it wasn't. The weight of the family name pressed down on him, heavy and unyielding. Despite the comfort and luxury, Franklin's world felt confined. He often looked out of his window, daydreaming of adventures. He longed to explore the world outside the grand walls of his house, to experience life beyond the riches and rules. He would often confide in his nanny, Mrs. Brown. One day, he'd say, looking at the horizon, I'm going to see the world and make a real difference. Mrs. Brown would smile, ruffling his hair, I believe you will, young master. Just always remember to follow your heart. Young Franklin wasn't just born to privilege. He was born with a restless spirit and a heart full of dreams. And as the days turned into years, that spirit would guide him through the challenges and triumphs of an incredible journey. The sun cast a golden hue as the carriage came to a stop in front of the imposing building. Young Franklin dressed in a crisp uniform, clutched his school bag tightly. This was Groton, one of the most prestigious schools for boys. The corridors echoed with chatter, and the walls were lined with portraits of notable alumni. Franklin was now part of a long tradition. Yet, amidst the thrill of a new chapter, there was nervousness. Would he fit in? On his first day, as he sat at his wooden desk, he glanced around at his classmates. They were the sons of America's elite, business tycoons, politicians, and lawyers. Franklin tried to focus on his lessons, but his thoughts often wandered to the world outside. Weekends were a relief. Franklin and his friends would often go on long bicycle rides, exploring the countryside. On one such ride, they ventured into a small village. The scene was so different from Hyde Park. Children played with simple toys, families worked together in the fields, and the houses were modest. Franklin was intrigued. He sat down with an old man from the village and listened to stories of hardships, joys, and simple pleasures. The conversation left a deep impact. The contrast between his life and the villagers was stark. Travel further shaped Franklin's perspective. His family voyages to Europe were grand, filled with visits to palaces, museums, and theaters. But what fascinated him most were the streets of cities like London and Paris. The sounds, the people, the energy, they were intoxicating. One day, in a Parisian cafe, he met a young poet who talked about revolution, freedom, and dreams. They debated for hours, and as Franklin left the cafe, his mind buzzed with new ideas. 
He began to understand that there was a vast world beyond the comforts of his home, a world with challenges, passions, and stories waiting to be discovered. Each adventure, every new friend, and every tale nudged Franklin a bit more. He began to pen his thoughts in a diary. There's a world out there, he wrote one evening, so diverse, so beautiful, and so complex. I've been in a bubble, but no more. I want to understand, to contribute, to truly live. As years passed, these experiences molded Franklin, making him question, think, and dream big. The boy from Hyde Park was evolving, and the leader was slowly taking shape, driven by curiosity and a passion for change. It was at a grand family gathering when Franklin first noticed Eleanor. Her radiant smile and confident demeanor set her apart from the others. Though they were distant cousins, their paths hadn't often crossed. Eleanor's laughter, genuine and infectious, caught Franklin's attention, and he felt an inexplicable urge to get to know her better. Their first conversation was brief but memorable. Eleanor spoke passionately about her recent charity work, and Franklin was impressed by her compassion and intelligence. As the evening drew to a close, he found himself hoping he'd see her again soon. Fate seemed to be on their side. Invitations to dances, picnics, and social events brought them together frequently. As they waltzed under shimmering chandeliers or strolled in moonlit gardens, the connection between them grew undeniable. Their conversations flowed effortlessly, and Franklin found in Eleanor not just a companion, but also a confidant. However, courtship in their social circle was seldom private. The watchful eyes of family and society ensured that their growing affection for each other remained under wraps. To share their feelings and dreams without reservation, they resorted to writing secret letters. Every letter Franklin received was a treasure. Eleanor's words, penned with care, revealed her innermost thoughts. In this world of constant change, she wrote in one, your presence feels like a comforting constant. Franklin would often read her letters late into the night, feeling the warmth of her words. In one of his replies, he wrote, Dear Eleanor, each day with you feels like a page from a beautiful story. I cherish our moments together and eagerly await many more. Their bond grew stronger, and the whispers of a potential union began to swirl among friends and family. It wasn't long before Franklin mustered the courage to propose. On a quiet evening, In the very garden where they'd had countless heart-to-hearts, he bent on one knee, presenting Eleanor with a delicate ring. Her eyes filled with tears of joy as she whispered, Yes. Their wedding was a grand affair, befitting two prominent figures of society. But amidst the fanfare and celebrations, what shone the brightest was their genuine love and commitment to each other. The young boy from Hyde Park, who once felt the weight of expectations, had now found a partner who understood him, loved him, and stood by him, ready to face the challenges and joys that life would bring their way. Chapter 2. A Calling to Serve The sun was just setting, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink. Franklin sat at his study table, surrounded by newspapers, books, and letters. The world outside was changing. America was facing challenges and needed leaders who could bring hope and direction. As he mulled over the thought, an idea began to form in his mind, politics. Franklin had grown up hearing tales of public service. The idea of making a real impact, of leading people towards progress, excited him. With Eleanor's support, he decided to dive into the world of politics. His first step was running for the New York State Senate. The journey was not easy. There were days of passionate speeches, reaching out to voters, and understanding their concerns. But there were also days of doubt, harsh criticisms, 
and skepticism. Can a Roosevelt, born with a silver spoon, truly understand the common man's plight? Many would question. Franklin's initial days in politics were a whirlwind. He met people from all walks of life, from farmers expressing concerns about their crops to factory workers talking about their wages. Each story, each interaction was a learning experience. Election day arrived. The air was thick with anticipation. As votes were counted, Franklin felt a mix of anxiety and hope. The final tally was announced. He had won. The thrill of victory was exhilarating. He could finally bring about the change he so deeply desired. However, politics is a field of highs and lows. Franklin's time in the Senate was marked by both triumphs and trials. He championed policies that he believed in, fighting for the rights of workers and pushing for reforms. But politics also brought challenges. There were those who disagreed with him, sometimes vehemently. One particular bill that Franklin supported faced severe opposition. Debates became heated, and the media was divided. Franklin put in his heart and soul, but the bill was defeated. It was a crushing blow. He retreated to his study, battling feelings of disappointment and doubt. Eleanor, ever the pillar of strength, sat down beside him. Every defeat, she whispered, is a lesson, Franklin. It's not the end, but just a bend in the journey. Franklin looked into her eyes and nodded. While defeat stung, he realized they also strengthened his resolve. His spirit, though momentarily dampened, was far from broken. As days turned into months and months into years, Franklin's journey in politics was marked by a roller coaster of emotions, the joy of serving the people, the challenges of navigating opposition, and the lessons learned from both victories and defeats. The boy from Hyde Park, once confined to the comforts of privilege, was now in the arena, ready to face whatever came his way. The office was grand, with tall windows and walls lined with portraits of naval heroes. Franklin gazed out, taking in the view of ships anchored in the harbor. His new role as the assistant secretary of the Navy was no small feat. The sea, with all its might and mystery, was now under his purview. His responsibilities were vast, from overseeing shipbuilding to ensuring the welfare of sailors. But what truly captivated him was the chance to modernize the Navy to make it a force ready for the future. One of his early decisions was to expand the fleet. The world was changing, and America needed to be prepared. Meetings with engineers and naval officers became a regular affair. They discussed ship designs, armaments, and strategies. Franklin was often the youngest in the room, but he listened intently, asking questions and taking notes. However, this ambitious plan faced resistance. There were budget concerns and critics who questioned the need for such expansion. Franklin was often in the spotlight, defending his vision with fervor and determination. A strong navy is not a luxury, he'd argue. It's a necessity. One evening, after a particularly grueling debate, Franklin walked along the docks. He watched as sailors worked, their faces glowing in the dim light. One young sailor approached him, saluting crisply. Sir, he said, his voice filled with respect, we've heard about your plans. We're with you. We believe in a stronger navy. Franklin's eyes misted. This was why he was here, not just for ships and strategy, but for these men these brave souls who looked to the horizon with hope and pride, his tenure also saw challenges. International tensions rose, and there were whispers of a looming war. Franklin felt the weight of responsibility. He was part of crucial decisions, from espionage missions to diplomatic negotiations. Sleepless nights became common 
with maps spread out on his desk and telegrams arriving at all hours. Eleanor watched him closely, worried about the strain. Take a moment for yourself, Franklin, she'd advise, her hand resting gently on his. But Franklin was consumed by his duty. This is bigger than me, Eleanor, he'd reply. I have to give it my all. The role of assistant secretary of the Navy wasn't just a job for Franklin. It was a calling. Through triumphs and trials, his passion for service shone brightly. The challenges of the role molded him, revealing a leader who was not only strategic and determined, but also deeply compassionate. Whispers filled the corridors of power. Newspapers buzzed with rumors. Franklin D. Roosevelt, the rising star of American politics, was allegedly involved in a scandal. It was a story tailor-made for his rivals, a mix of intrigue, hidden secrets, and power plays. But for Franklin, it was a personal challenge like no other. It all began with an anonymous letter addressed to a prominent newspaper. The contents hinted at misuse of funds under Franklin's watch in the Navy. The media lapped it up, creating a sensation. Headlines screamed of corruption, and overnight, Franklin found himself in the eye of a storm. Franklin was baffled. He had always conducted his work with integrity. But the seed of doubt had been planted in the public's mind. Friends advised him to lay low, to wait for the storm to pass. But that wasn't Franklin's style. One evening, Eleanor found him in his study, surrounded by ledgers and papers. I will fight this, he declared, determination shining in his eyes. I have nothing to hide. And fight he did. Franklin called for an open investigation. He met with auditors, went through documents line by line, and gave public speeches defending his honor. The process was grueling, with long hours and intense scrutiny. But Franklin remained steadfast. Meanwhile, he began his own cover inquiries, trying to find the source of the accusations. It soon became clear. Political rivals, threatened by his rising popularity, were behind the smear campaign. They had hoped to tarnish his image, to halt his meteoric rise. But they had underestimated him. As the investigation progressed, no evidence of wrongdoing emerged. On the contrary, it showcased Franklin's meticulousness and dedication to his role. The tables began to turn. Then came the day of vindication. The investigation concluded, clearing him of all charges. Newspapers, once filled with accusations, now hailed his integrity. But for Franklin, the victory was bittersweet. The episode had shown him the darker side of politics. Eleanor held him close that night. They tried to break you, she whispered, but they only made you stronger. Franklin looked out of the window, the city lights twinkling in the distance. The ordeal had been tough but it had also forged a new steeliness in him. They can try, he murmured, his voice filled with quiet resolve, but I'll always stand tall, for truth, for honor, and for the people I serve. Chapter 3. Struck Down, But Not Out The sun cast a warm golden glow on the Roosevelt estate. Children's laughter echoed, birds chirped, and the gentle rustle of leaves added to the idyllic setting. It was a perfect summer day, but within the walls of the Roosevelt home, a shadow had descended. It started innocuously. Franklin felt a nagging fatigue and a slight pain in his back. Thinking it to be the result of his relentless work, he brushed it aside. However, as days turned into weeks, his symptoms worsened. His legs felt heavy, making even the simplest tasks daunting. Concerned, Eleanor called the best doctors. The diagnosis was shattering. Polio, a disease that affected the nervous system, leaving its victims paralyzed. For a man who thrived on action, who had boundless energy, 
the news was a cruel blow. The vibrant, dynamic Franklin was confined to a bed, his legs refusing to obey him. Nights were the hardest. Lying in the dimly lit room, Franklin would often look out of the window, lost in thought. Memories of his active life, playing with his children, dancing with Eleanor, his political pursuits, flooded back, bringing with them a tide of emotions. Anger, despair, frustration, each emotion battled for dominance. One particularly difficult night, Eleanor found him gazing at an old family photo. Tears glistened in his eyes. Will I ever be able to stand again? He whispered, his voice trembling with vulnerability. Eleanor, always his pillar, took his hand. We'll face this together, she promised, her voice unwavering. Remember, you're not alone. Franklin's recovery was a test of grit and determination. Each day presented a new challenge. Physiotherapy sessions were grueling, often leaving him exhausted, but he refused to give up. With Eleanor's constant support and his children's love, he embarked on the journey to regain his strength. There were moments of despair, of course, days when the weight of his condition seemed too much to bear, but there were also days of hope. The first time he managed to move his toe, the room erupted in cheers. It was a small movement, but for Franklin, it was a giant leap. Outside the world continued its pace. Rumors of his condition spread, and many believed his political career was over. But Franklin wasn't ready to be written off. From his bed, he kept abreast of political developments, consulted with colleagues, and even made decisions. The mysterious illness had struck him down but it hadn't defeated him. Franklin D. Roosevelt was down, but he was certainly not out. The world would soon see his indomitable spirit rise, stronger and more determined than ever. The grand rooms of the Roosevelt mansion were filled with hushed tones. Shadows seemed to linger, even during the sunniest of days. The once lively and spirited Franklin now faced a world drastically altered. With limited mobility, each day felt longer, heavier. The silence was the worst part. The once bustling politician, always surrounded by colleagues and well-wishers, now spent hours staring at the ceiling. The conversations he once led were now replaced by his own inner monologues, often filled with self-doubt and regret. Why me? Franklin would often think, a question to which there seemed to be no answer. Eleanor watched her husband, her heart breaking a little every day. The man who once held her in a sweeping dance, who ran around playing with their children, was now confined to a wheelchair or bed. She missed his laughter, his energy, and his undying optimism. One evening, as raindrops created a rhythmic pattern on the windows, Franklin looked at Eleanor. What if I can never walk again? He asked, the weight of his fears evident in his eyes. What if this is the end of my journey? Eleanor took a deep breath. Then we find a new path, she replied softly. Life might have changed, but our journey together hasn't ended. Franklin's children too felt the profound change in their home. The playful and enthusiastic father was now quiet and contemplative. They tried, in their own ways, to bring cheer. Little notes were left on his bedside, drawings made, and songs sung. Their innocence and love were a soothing balm for Franklin's troubled soul. Friends visited, trying to boost his spirits, but the conversations were often awkward. The once confident Franklin was now unsure of his place in the world. His political career, his ambitions, his dreams, all seemed distant, like stars on a cloudy night. But amidst the darkness, there were also moments of light, moments when the old Franklin shone through, like when he'd laugh heartily at a joke or passionately discuss a political development. These moments were fleeting, 
but they were reminders of the spirit that still burned bright within him. The journey through these dark days was not easy, but with the support of his family, the love of his children, and his own unyielding spirit, Franklin slowly began to find his way back. The road was long, filled with challenges and heartbreak, but it was also a road that would lead him to rediscover himself and find purpose in adversity. The dawn of a new day painted the sky in hues of orange and pink. Inside the Roosevelt Mansion, a similar dawn was breaking. Eleanor sat beside Franklin's bed, holding a letter. It was an invitation to speak at a public event. Franklin's initial reaction was to decline. How could he, in his state, address a crowd? But Eleanor thought differently. Franklin, she began, her voice steady and encouraging. This could be your moment, your chance to show the world and yourself that you are still here, still ready to lead. Franklin looked at her, uncertainty clouding his eyes. The thought of facing a public audience while battling his own physical limitations was daunting. What if I fail? What if people see me as weak? Eleanor gently squeezed his hand. It's not about how they see you, but how you see yourself. Remember, strength isn't just physical. It's in the heart, in the mind. You have that strength, Franklin. You just need to find it again. Over the next few weeks, the Roosevelt home was abuzz with activity. Speechwriters came and went, plans were discussed, and arrangements made but the real transformation was happening within Franklin. With each passing day, he found a bit more of his old self. The fire in his eyes, the passion in his voice, they all returned bit by bit. The day of the speech arrived. As Franklin was wheeled onto the stage, a hush fell over the audience. All eyes were on him, filled with a mix of curiosity, sympathy, and anticipation. Franklin took a deep breath, gripping the sides of his wheelchair. My fellow Americans, he began, his voice resonating with the confidence of old. As he spoke, the audience was captivated, not by his physical state, but by the power of his words, the conviction in his beliefs, and the vision he laid out for the future. When he finished, the hall erupted in applause. The standing ovation went on for minutes, but for Franklin, it felt like an eternity. As he looked out into the sea of faces, he saw admiration, respect, and hope. Eleanor stood backstage, tears of pride in her eyes. She had always believed in him, even when he doubted himself. Today, he had proved not just to the world, but to himself, that he still had much to offer. From that day on, Franklin's journey took a new direction. No longer confined by his physical limitations, he embraced a new purpose, fueled by his indomitable spirit and the unwavering support of Eleanor. The challenges ahead were many, but Franklin D. Roosevelt had found the will to move forward. Chapter 4. Road to the White House. New York the vibrant heart of America, was under a dark cloud. The streets that once buzzed with energy and optimism now echoed with despair. The Great Depression had taken its toll, with jobless men standing in long lines and families struggling to make ends meet. Hopes were fading, dreams shattering. In the midst of this chaos, Franklin D. Roosevelt stepped into the role of governor of New York. It was a daunting task, leading a state crippled by the economic downturn. Many questioned his ability, especially given his physical challenges, but Franklin was undeterred. His first days in office were a whirlwind. Advisors presented grim statistics, each figure painting a bleaker picture than the last. Franklin would sit his desk, deep in thought, often gazing out of the window at the bustling streets below. He could see the suffering in the eyes of the people, and he knew he had to act. One evening, Eleanor found him surrounded by papers, 
his brow furrowed in concentration. The weight of the world seems to be on your shoulders, she commented gently. Franklin looked up, a tired smile on his face. It's the weight of New York for now, he replied, but we'll lift it together. And lift it they did. With a team of trusted advisors, Franklin rolled out a series of initiatives aimed at providing relief to the unemployed, boosting the economy, and restoring hope. His fireside chats, delivered over the radio, became a source of comfort and inspiration for many. His voice, filled with empathy and determination, reassured the people that better days were ahead. The challenges were many. Opposition was strong, with critics lambasting his policies and questioning his decisions. But Franklin remained steadfast. He often told his team, We must do something. We cannot let our people suffer. And his efforts began to bear fruit. Slowly, the economy showed signs of recovery. Job programs provided employment to thousands, infrastructure projects revived cities, and confidence began to return. Franklin's leadership during these trying times caught the attention of the nation. People began to talk. Here was a man who, despite personal challenges, was steering New York out of its darkest days. Could he do the same for the nation? Whispers turned into discussions, discussions into debates, and soon the idea took root. Franklin D. Roosevelt for president. As New York started to rise from the ashes of the Depression, so too did Franklin's political star. The road to the White House beckoned, and Franklin, with Eleanor by his side, was ready to answer the call. The year was 1932, and America stood at a crossroads. The Great Depression cast a gloomy shadow, and people were desperate for change, for hope. In these tumultuous times, Franklin's name echoed in every corner, from bustling cities to quiet farms. The nation had heard tales of his success in New York. They'd listened to his warm voice over the radio, a voice that felt like a comforting hand on a worried shoulder. Could this man be the change we need? They wondered. Franklin, sensing the nation's pulse, began his campaign. Traveling was not easy for him, but his determination was unwavering. At every stop, crowds gathered, eager to see the man who had brought New York back from the brink. One evening, in a small town square, Franklin spoke from the back of an open car. He spoke not as a distant politician, but as one of them. We are in this together, he said, and together we can find our way out. The crowd listened, captivated. In his words, they found reassurance. In his promises, they saw a vision of a brighter future. Old men nodded in agreement. Mothers held their children closer, feeling a flicker of hope. Eleanor, watching from the sidelines, could see the connection Franklin made with the people. She whispered to a friend, He doesn't just speak to them, he speaks for them. But the journey wasn't without hurdles. Critics and rivals tried to use Franklin's health against him, casting doubts about his ability to lead. To this, Franklin responded not with anger, but with wit and grace. They say I can't stand up, he remarked at a gathering, but they forget that I don't back down. As the days rolled on, a movement began to build. Roosevelt for president, signs dotted lawns, windows, and local shops. People, young and old, rallied behind him, drawn to his charisma and the promise of a new deal for America. As the election approached, the excitement was palpable. Families huddled around radios, waiting for updates. Children imitated Franklin in school debates, and songs were written in his honor. On election day, the nation spoke with a clear voice, choosing Franklin D. Roosevelt as their beacon of hope. As the results were announced, Franklin sat with Eleanor, their hands intertwined. 
We have a tough road ahead, he murmured. Eleanor nodded, but we'll walk it together. And so, with the weight of a nation's hopes on his shoulders, Franklin D. Roosevelt prepared to embark on his journey as the President of the United States, ready to steer America into a new era of prosperity and progress. The morning of March 4, 1933, dawned cold and gray, but despite the chill in the air, Washington, D.C. was buzzing with anticipation. Thousands had gathered, their breath visible in the crisp air, waiting to witness a new chapter in American history. Franklin, dressed in a tailored suit, sat silently in the car that moved slowly towards the Capitol. Beside him, Eleanor held a comforting presence. Every so often, their eyes would meet, sharing unspoken emotions. The weight of the moment was immense, and even Franklin, always the pillar of strength, felt a flutter of nerves. He thought of the millions suffering across the country, of the daunting task ahead, and for a moment, doubt crept in. Can I truly make a difference, he wondered. Eleanor, sensing his thoughts, whispered, You were chosen for this time for this moment. America believes in you. Upon arriving, Franklin was wheeled up the platform, the majestic capital dome behind him. As he rose from his wheelchair to take the oath, the crowd held its collective breath. With one hand on the Bible and the other raised, he recited the sacred words, committing himself to the service of the nation. The moment the oath was complete, a wave of applause and cheers echoed across the grounds. Hats were thrown into the air, tears were shed, and for a brief moment, the worries of the Depression seemed to fade. Franklin then stepped forward to address the nation. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself, he began. Those words, simple yet profound, resonated deeply with the listeners. He painted a picture of unity, resilience, and hope. He spoke of the challenges, but emphasized the indomitable American spirit. People listened, captivated by his sincerity and vision. Many were moved to tears, not just by his words, but by the conviction with which he spoke them. They saw not just a president, but a leader who genuinely understood their struggles. After the ceremony, as night began to fall, Franklin and Eleanor attended the inaugural ball. The grand hall was filled with the sound of music, laughter, and chatter. But amidst the festivities, Franklin's thoughts were elsewhere. The real work was about to begin, and he was ready. Later that night, as the city's lights twinkled in the distance, Franklin sat by the window in the White House. The enormity of his new role weighed on him, but he was not afraid. With Eleanor by his side and the trust of the nation behind him, President Roosevelt was poised to lead America into a brighter future. Chapter 5. The New Deal the country was like a ship in stormy seas, and President Roosevelt stood at the helm, determined to navigate it to safer shores. The once great America was now a land of empty pockets and broken dreams. Bread lines stretched around city blocks, and hope was a rare commodity. But from the majestic White House, a new wind was beginning to blow. Something has to change, Roosevelt murmured one evening, pouring over papers in the Oval Office. His desk was littered with letters from ordinary Americans, each a heart-wrenching tale of suffering and desperation. He picked up one from a mother in Oklahoma. Her words painted a bleak picture of hunger, cold, and despair. Eleanor, always his pillar of strength, nodded in agreement. The people need something to believe in, Franklin. And so, Roosevelt and his team began crafting what would be known as the New Deal, a bold, ambitious plan aimed at reviving the nation's economy and spirits. It wasn't easy. Critics were many and obstacles plenty, but Roosevelt was undeterred. With every decision, he thought of the suffering mother from Oklahoma, 
the jobless father from Detroit, the hungry child from New York. The New Deal introduced programs that were revolutionary for their time. There were jobs created for the unemployed financial reforms to stabilize the economy and relief for the hungry and homeless. Places like the Tennessee Valley saw massive dam projects bringing electricity and employment. Young men found purpose in the Civilian Conservation Corps, planting trees and building roads. When Roosevelt announced these programs in his fireside chats over the radio, families across the nation would gather around, hanging onto his every word. His voice, warm and reassuring, became a beacon of hope. Help is on the way, he promised. Despite the challenges, it was evident that Roosevelt's bold plans were making an impact. Empty streets began to buzz with activity again. Dark homes lit up with newly installed electricity, and despair slowly transformed into hope. However, not everyone was in favor. Some saw the New Deal as too radical, too risky. Whispered criticisms turned into loud objections, but Roosevelt was resolute. We cannot let fear stop us, he would say. We must act, and act now. One evening, as he and Eleanor sat on the White House balcony, he pondered aloud, Will it be enough? Eleanor, gazing at the twinkling city lights, responded, It's a start, Franklin. A promise of a better tomorrow. And for many, that's exactly what the New Deal was a promise that the darkness of the Great Depression would eventually give way to the dawn of a brighter, more prosperous America. As the New Deal policies began to take shape, not everyone was on board. The winds of change sweeping across the nation were met with resistance from various corners. In the grand halls of Congress, politicians debated passionately. While many recognized the need for drastic measures, Others found Roosevelt's plans too radical, even un-American. I fear we're trading our liberties for false promises, Senator Mitchell remarked in a heated session. Whispers of agreement echoed around the room. Business tycoons, wary of new regulations, joined the chorus of dissent. They felt Roosevelt's policies were a threat to free enterprise and the capitalist spirit of America. Evening dinners at the White House became a space for intense discussions. Eleanor, always an avid listener, would often relay stories of people she met, emphasizing their desperate need for help. We must think of the people, she would remind Franklin. But it was not just the powerful elites who voiced concerns. Ordinary citizens, influenced by sensational headlines and fear, started wondering if Roosevelt was leading the nation down a perilous path. One evening, as Roosevelt was reading a newspaper, he came across a scathing critique of his policies. The words stung, but what pained him more was the thought that the country he loved so dearly was so deeply divided. He looked up to find Eleanor watching him, a concerned look on her face. It's not easy, she said, touching his hand gently but no change ever is. Franklin nodded. He knew she was right. It's just, I wish they could see the bigger picture, he sighed. Eleanor leaned in. You have to show them, Franklin. Speak to their hearts, not just their minds. And so, Roosevelt continued with his fireside chats. These intimate radio broadcasts allowed him to directly address the nation's concerns. He explained his policies, clarified misunderstandings, and reassured Americans of his unwavering commitment to their well-being. As the days turned into months, some critics were won over by his sincerity and determination. Others remained skeptical, but Roosevelt was undeterred. Late one night, after a particularly challenging day, Franklin sat by the fireplace, lost in thought. Eleanor? ever his rock, joined him. Remember, she whispered, storms make trees take deeper roots. Franklin smiled, drawing strength from her words. 
He knew the road ahead was tough, but he was ready to face it, knowing that the hope of a better future for all Americans was worth every challenge. Time moved on, and the results of the New Deal began to show. The country, once crippled by the weight of the Great Depression, started to stir to life once more. New infrastructures stood tall, jobless men and women found work, and families no longer went to bed hungry. Roosevelt's vision was gradually unfolding before the nation's eyes. However, Franklin never gloated about the successes. In the quiet moments when he was alone in his office, he would sometimes reflect on the journey, on the highs and the lows. He would think of the critics of the doubts and the challenges, and he would be reminded that victory wasn't just in the results, but in the perseverance. One evening, as the golden hues of sunset painted the White House, Eleanor came to him, holding a newspaper. The headline read, New Deal, A Beacon of Hope for America. Eleanor looked at him with pride. You did this, she said, her voice filled with emotion. Franklin, eyes glistening, shook his head gently. We did this, he replied, emphasizing the collective effort. The nation did this. It was true. While many of his policies became monumental pillars, Franklin knew that they would have amounted to nothing without the hard work and belief of the American people. They had embraced change, tackled challenges, and emerged stronger. The Social Security Act, the establishment of the Securities and Exchange Commission, the initiation of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, all these and more became testaments to the transformative power of the New Deal. Not only did they help lift America from the Depression, but they also laid the foundation for future generations. Rumors and whispers of a possible Nobel Peace Prize for Roosevelt began to circulate. While the recognition was flattering, Franklin wasn't driven by accolades. For him, the real reward was the smiling faces of his fellow countrymen, the bustling streets, the laughter of children playing without a care in the world. As the years rolled on, Roosevelt's legacy became evident. The nation was not just surviving. It was thriving. The critics, many of them, had been proven wrong. One chilly winter morning, as Franklin sat by the window watching the snowfall, he felt a deep sense of contentment. The journey had been hard, filled with battles both personal and political. But in the end, the New Deal was more than just a set of policies. It was a testament to the indomitable spirit of America. And as the snowflakes danced in the air, Roosevelt made a silent promise to keep fighting for that spirit for as long as he lived. Chapter 6. The Gathering Storm. It was a period of unease. While America was recovering from its internal challenges, the world outside was like a pot of water, slowly coming to boil. News from across the Atlantic brought tales of territorial expansions, broken treaties, and ambitious dictators. Every morning, Franklin would sit with his cup of coffee, flipping through the international section of the newspaper. The headlines spoke of Japan's conquests in the East and Germany's ambitions in Europe. The shadows of war grew longer with each passing day. Eleanor, ever his confidant, sensed Franklin's growing concern. They would often talk late into the night about the role America might play in this brewing storm. We've worked so hard to rebuild our nation— she said one evening, her voice thick with worry. But if the world falls apart, what then? Franklin looked out of the window, the weight of leadership heavy on his shoulders. I hope for peace, Eleanor, he replied softly, but we must be prepared for every eventuality. In the public eye, Roosevelt maintained a stance of neutrality. The scars of the First World War were still fresh in many Americans' minds, and the general sentiment was to avoid getting entangled in another global conflict. But in private, Franklin was deeply troubled. 
He recognized that the world was changing rapidly and America couldn't isolate itself forever. He began holding secret meetings with his advisors, discussing strategies and exploring potential alliances. One evening, as a cold wind howled outside, Franklin sat by the fireplace, lost in thought. The flickering flames seemed to mirror the turbulent emotions within him. Eleanor, understanding his mood, placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. It's a heavy burden, she whispered, but remember, you're not carrying it alone. Franklin nodded, drawing strength from her words. It's a storm, Eleanor, he said, and I fear it's coming our way. And as the days turned into weeks and weeks into months, the whispers of war grew louder. The world stood on the brink, and America, under Roosevelt's leadership, had to make a choice to watch from the sidelines or to step into the fray. The tension in the air was palpable. Every radio broadcast, every newspaper headline, and every diplomatic telegram seemed to herald the approach of a great storm. The European theater was alive with activity, and it was becoming increasingly clear that the world was heading towards another monumental conflict. Franklin spent many a sleepless night in the Oval Office, maps spread out before him, advisors buzzing around with the latest intelligence. He had always held hope that the world would find its way back from the brink, but with each passing day, that hope dwindled. Many Americans had the memories of the First World War fresh in their minds. They remembered the young men who had gone overseas, never to return. The general sentiment was clear. America wanted to remain neutral. And Franklin, empathizing with his people's sentiments, did his best to respect that wish. But Roosevelt was no fool. He understood the stakes. If Europe fell to the dark forces that were spreading across it, it would only be a matter of time before those same forces turned their eyes to America. One evening, as he sat in his study, Eleanor walked in, sensing the cloud of worry that seemed to permanently hang over her husband. Franklin, she began gently, you can't carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. The decision you make will be for the best of our nation. Franklin looked up, his eyes tired but resolute. I want to keep our people safe, Eleanor, but I can't help but think of the innocent lives at stake across the ocean. In the months that followed, Roosevelt made a series of moves that would both ensure America's preparedness and show support to the nation standing against the rising tide of tyranny. The Lend-Lease Act was one such step, providing crucial support to Britain and other allies. But with every ship, plane, or tank that America sent across the seas, there was a silent acknowledgement of the reality the nation might soon face. In public speeches, Franklin championed the cause of peace and democracy, subtly preparing the American populace for what might come next. We cannot shut our eyes to the fact he said in one such address that the world is on the edge of a great conflict and we must be ready to play our part. As the storm clouds gathered on the horizon, Roosevelt's stance became a delicate dance, a balance between respecting the wishes of a war-weary nation and ensuring that America was ready to face any threat. In his heart, he hoped for peace but in his actions he prepared for war. It was a serene Sunday morning on December 7, 1941. The sun painted the sky with hues of gold and orange, casting a gentle warmth over the Pacific waters. But what started as a calm morning would soon turn into a day that would live in infamy. Far from the tranquility of Washington, the naval base of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii bustled with activity. Sailors went about their daily tasks, sharing stories and jokes, unaware of the dark clouds gathering on the horizon. Back at the White House, Franklin sat in his study, going through his morning briefings. He was looking forward to a quiet day, 
perhaps a short drive through the countryside with Eleanor. Little did he know that his plans, and indeed the fate of the nation, were about to change dramatically. As the clock hands moved closer to eight o'clock a.m., a swarm of aircraft bearing the red emblem of the rising sun appeared over the horizon of Hawaii. With precision and ruthlessness, they unleashed their deadly cargo onto the unsuspecting American fleet below. Battleships, aircraft, and innocent lives were obliterated in the surprise attack. News of the assault reached Washington swiftly. Franklin's private phone line rang with urgency. As he picked up the receiver and heard the grim details, a chill ran down his spine. Eleanor, sensing something was terribly wrong, rushed to his side. The weight of the news pressed heavily upon them both. The room seemed to close in on Franklin. The voices of his advisors became distant echoes as the magnitude of the attack sank in. His thoughts raced. How could they have been caught so off guard? What did this mean for America's future? He looked out of the window, taking a deep breath. Eleanor squeezed his hand, her eyes searching his for answers. We've been thrust into the storm, Eleanor, he whispered, the weight of the moment evident in his voice. In the following hours, Roosevelt met with his military chiefs, demanding answers and charting the course forward. The atmosphere was thick with tension, but amidst the chaos, Franklin's leadership shone through. His voice was firm, his resolve unshaken. America would respond. The next day, Franklin D. Roosevelt addressed the nation and the world. His voice, broadcast over radio waves, carried a mix of sadness, anger, and determination. December 7, 1941, he began, a date which will live in infamy. With those words, America's course was set. The nation would go to war. The storm had arrived, and under Roosevelt's leadership, America would face it head-on. Chapter 7. Wartime Leadership Dark clouds hovered on the horizon. The events of Pearl Harbor had shaken the nation to its core. Amid the grief and anger, a pressing question rose. What next? America, once watching the war from afar, was now at its very heart. The morning after the attack, Franklin stood before his vast desk, flooded with reports of damage, casualty numbers, and military suggestions. He felt the weight of the nation's eyes on him, waiting for direction, waiting for hope. He called upon his advisors, military chiefs, and key members of Congress. The room buzzed with the urgency of the moment. Everyone spoke of retaliation, strategies, and military deployments. But Franklin knew that before they could respond on the battlefield, he had to prepare the nation's spirit. Eleanor, sensing his thoughts, whispered, They need to hear from you, Franklin. He nodded, understanding the gravity of the moment. The next day, Roosevelt addressed the nation through one of his famous fireside chats. My fellow Americans, he began, his voice deep and firm, we have been attacked, but we are not defeated. We are a nation built on courage, resilience, and unity. Now, more than ever, we need to come together. Roosevelt spoke of the need to shift America's industries, to produce weapons and supplies for the war. Factories that once made cars and toys would now manufacture tanks and planes. Young men and women were encouraged to join the armed forces and support roles. Every citizen had a part to play, whether on the battlefield or the home front. Each one of us has a role in this great endeavor, he continued. We are not just fighting for our land, but for the very ideals that define us. The speech was a turning point. Across the country, people responded to Roosevelt's call. Factories transformed overnight. Citizens, young and old, queued up to contribute, whether by enlisting, buying war bonds, or collecting materials. 
America, in its darkest hour, was waking up, ready to fight. In the ornate rooms of the White House, leaders from around the world gathered. The air was thick with tension, but also with hope. They were there to craft a strategy, to decide how they would collectively respond to the war's challenges. Roosevelt sat at the head of a long wooden table, flanked by Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. The trio, with their aides and advisors, were an unlikely group, each with distinct views and priorities. But they shared one common goal, victory. Churchill, with his trademark cigar, leaned in, Franklin, the Axis powers are formidable, but with combined strength, we can outflank them. Stalin, ever the pragmatist, added, it's not just about strength, but also strategy. We need to be smart, coordinated. Franklin nodded, absorbing their insights. He recognized the importance of these alliances. America, despite its might, couldn't win this war alone. Yet alliances also brought challenges. Trust had to be built, and compromises made. There were disagreements, sometimes heated, as each leader pushed for what they believed was best for their country and the world. Late one evening, after a particularly intense debate, Eleanor found Franklin in his study, deep in thought. It's a delicate balance, isn't it? She asked, handing him a cup of tea. Franklin sighed, yes, Eleanor. It's like a complex game of chess, where every move affects the next. However, as weeks turned into months, the trio, often referred to as the Big Three, began to find common ground. Strategies were mapped out, resources pooled, and joint operations launched. These alliances, built on trust and necessity, proved critical. Through coordinated attacks, shared intelligence, and mutual support, the tide of the war slowly began to turn. As the war raged on outside, inside the White House another battle was being fought. The reflection that Franklin saw in the mirror each morning began to change. His once robust frame now appeared frail, and deep lines creased his forehead, tracing the stress and responsibilities he shouldered. Each morning, Franklin would rise from bed, gripping the handles of his wheelchair with determination. But the strong grip couldn't hide the tremor in his hands. The war wasn't just being fought on distant shores. It was etched onto his very skin. Eleanor, ever observant, noticed the pale hue of his face, the way his laughter didn't quite reach his eyes anymore. Franklin, she whispered one evening, her fingers brushing against his, you can't carry the weight of the world alone. He smiled wearily, I have to, Eleanor, it's my duty. But as the days turned into nights, and nights back into days, the strain became more evident. Meals were often left untouched, and sleep eluded him. Confidential reports, telegrams, and decisions awaited his attention, but fatigue often overtook him, forcing him to rest. One evening, after a particularly long day of meetings, Franklin felt a sharp pain in his chest. Grasping the edge of the desk, he tried to steady himself. Eleanor, who had entered the room to offer him some tea, rushed to his side, her face etched with concern. Franklin, we need to get you to rest. As he lay in bed, surrounded by concerned faces, Franklin's thoughts were not on himself, but on the millions who looked up to him for leadership. The war. The people. I can't let them down, he murmured. Chapter 8. Winds of Change. As the tides of war began to turn, Franklin's thoughts shifted to the future. The world had been torn apart, and now it was the responsibility of its leaders to stitch it back together. Every night, while the White House was bathed in the dim light of evening, Roosevelt would sit by his window, looking at the stars, dreaming of a world united in peace. 
I see a place, he began one day speaking to Eleanor, where nations come together, not as enemies, but as allies. A place where differences are celebrated and conflicts are resolved with words and not weapons. Eleanor, intrigued by his vision, asked, What do you call this place, Franklin? He paused for a moment, lost in thought. A United Nations, he responded, his voice filled with hope. His advisors were skeptical. It's a beautiful dream, Mr. President, one of them remarked. But can nations, after such a brutal war, really come together in trust and collaboration? Franklin, never one to back down from a challenge, replied with determination, We have to try. For the sake of future generations, we must pave a path of unity and peace. And so, Roosevelt started holding secret meetings with leaders from around the world. They discussed borders, economies, and most importantly, the prevention of future wars. Though weakened in health, his spirit was as strong as ever. Children playing in the gardens of the White House would often overhear the President's passionate conversations about this new world order. They didn't understand the complexities of diplomacy or politics, but they could sense the hope in Roosevelt's voice. It was a hope that resonated with millions across the nation and beyond. In the cold winter of 1945, a historic meeting took place in the city of Yalta, a seaside resort on the Black Sea coast. The leaders of the three major Allied powers, Franklin D. Roosevelt of the United States, Winston Churchill of Britain, and Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, came together to discuss the fate of the world after the war. The air was thick with tension. These leaders, often referred to as the Big Three, had distinct visions for the future. They were united against the common enemy, but had differences that needed careful negotiation. Roosevelt, ever the diplomat, played the role of mediator. He wanted a balanced world where every nation had a voice. Churchill, with the scars of two world wars, sought security for his empire and Europe. Stalin, on the other hand, was looking to expand Soviet influence in Eastern Europe. Franklin could feel the weight of the moment. As he sat across from these giants of history, he often found himself reflecting on the enormity of their task. We shape the world for our children and their children, he murmured to himself one evening. One night, after a particularly long discussion, Churchill and Roosevelt found themselves alone on a balcony overlooking the Black Sea. Churchill with his signature cigar, remarked, These decisions, Franklin, they're not easy, but we must make them, for the sake of peace. Roosevelt nodded, feeling the weight of the world on his shoulders. I know, Winston, he replied, we have to find common ground. We owe it to the millions who've suffered. Despite their differences, the big three made some crucial decisions at Yalta, they discussed the division of Germany, the creation of the United Nations, and the future of Eastern Europe. It was a meeting that would shake the world for decades to come. As the Yalta Conference came to an end, the impact of the decisions made there began to take shape. The world watched closely as these three powerful leaders navigated a new global landscape. Franklin returned to America with mixed emotions. He felt hopeful about the possibilities of a peaceful post-war world, but was also aware of the compromises he had made. Some decisions, especially those regarding Eastern Europe, weighed heavily on his mind. One evening he sat in his study, gazing at the reports from Yalta. Eleanor walked in, sensing his contemplative mood. Deep in thought? she asked placing a gentle hand on his shoulder. Franklin sighed. It's the weight of these decisions, Eleanor. I wonder if we've done enough for the sake of peace. Eleanor took a moment, then replied, You've always done what you believed was right for the world. 
That's all anyone can do. Franklin nodded, taking comfort in her words. I just hope, he said, that the world we're building is one of lasting peace and understanding. The discussions at Yalta had indeed laid the groundwork for the United Nations, an institution Roosevelt believed in deeply. It was his hope that this organization would prevent future conflicts and promote cooperation among nations. However, as the months went by, it became clear that not all of Yalta's promises would be kept. Tensions began to rise, especially in Eastern Europe. The Iron Curtain, as Churchill called it, was descending. Chapter 9, Final Days The sun had barely risen, casting a gentle hue over the White House. Birds chirped softly, signaling the arrival of another day. Inside, however, a different atmosphere took hold. Franklin was up earlier than most, staring out of his bedroom window. His once robust frame now seemed frail, his face etched with the stress of leading a nation through its darkest days. The burden of the presidency, combined with the war's toll and personal health battles, weighed on him heavily. It was no secret to those close to him that he was tired, but few knew the extent of his ailments. Eleanor, ever observant, could sense a change in her husband, a hidden pain behind his eyes. One evening, as they dined privately, she took his hand. Franklin, she began, you can't carry the world's worries alone. You must consider your health. Franklin looked at her, his blue eyes holding a mix of fatigue and determination. The people need hope, Eleanor. I can't let them see me faltering. But at what cost? She pressed. You've given so much. It's time to think of yourself, too. His doctor had also voiced concerns. Blood pressure readings were high, and there were other signs of deteriorating health. The doctor advised rest, but Roosevelt felt there was too much to do, too many people relying on him. Late at night, when the world was silent and he was alone with his thoughts, doubt would creep in. Would he live to see the end of the war? Would his vision for a peaceful world come to fruition? But every morning... He would brush those doubts aside, don his signature smile, and face the world with courage. Golden leaves fluttered to the ground as Franklin's car approached the familiar grounds of Warm Springs. It was his sanctuary, a place where he found solace and rejuvenation. The rolling hills and the gentle hum of nature offered a stark contrast to the bustling corridors of the White House. As the car pulled up, Franklin could feel the weight on his shoulders lighten a little. This was the place where he first sought refuge after the crippling blow of his illness. Here, the mineral-rich waters offered relief, not just to his body, but also to his spirit. Lucy, a trusted caregiver and friend, greeted him with a warm smile. "'Welcome back, Mr. President,' she said, helping him out of the car." Franklin's face broke into a grin. It's always good to be back, Lucy. Walking through the gardens, memories flooded back. Lincoln remembered the first time he arrived at Warm Springs, filled with despair. But the community here had offered support, empathy, and most importantly, hope. Now, as the country's leader, he wished he could impart some of that hope onto every American. Eleanor, seeing her husband's distant look, squeezed his hand. This place always brings back memories, doesn't it? Franklin nodded. Yes, it reminds me of the challenges we've overcome and the strength we can find when we pull together. Evenings were his favorite. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a warm orange glow, he would sit on the porch, listening to the distant chirps of crickets. These were the moments of reflection, moments when he could dream about a brighter future for his country and the world. But even in this idyllic setting, the wariness never completely left him. 
His heart carried the weight of a nation at war, the dreams of a peaceful world, and the personal challenge of failing health. Yet, Warm Springs, with its healing waters and serene surroundings, provided a brief respite. It was a reminder that amidst the trials of life, there are pockets of peace, if only one knows where to look. A crisp morning breeze rustled through Warm Springs. Birds sang their early melodies, and the world seemed to be waking up to a fresh new day. Inside his quarters, Franklin was seated by his desk, flipping through papers and lost in thought. He felt a sharp pain in his temple. Thinking it was just another of those passing headaches, he massaged his forehead and tried to focus. However, the pain intensified. His vision blurred and a heavy weight pressed down on his chest. He gasped, trying to summon someone, anyone. Lucy, hearing a faint thud, rushed into the room, her eyes widening in alarm. She found Franklin slumped over his desk. The scene unfolded in a blur. Panicked calls, doctors rushing in, and Eleanor's heart-wrenching cries echoing through the corridors. News of the president's sudden demise traveled at lightning speed. From city streets to remote farms, radios announced the heartbreaking news, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt is no more. Flags were lowered to half-mast. People everywhere stopped in their tracks, tears streaming down their faces. A collective sense of loss enveloped the nation. Franklin, their leader, their beacon of hope during the toughest times, was gone. On the steps of the White House, a young boy turned to his mother. Mama, why are people crying? She knelt down, wiping away her own tears. We've lost a great man, son. President Roosevelt was like a captain, guiding a ship through a storm. Now the storm is still raging, and our captain is gone. In the days that followed, thousands lined up to pay their respects. From the poorest to the most influential, they all came, their faces a testament to the profound impact Franklin had made on their lives. Amidst the grief, stories of his legacy emerged. People remembered his laughter, his indomitable spirit, and his vision for a better world. They recalled his fireside chats, where he spoke not as a distant leader, but as a comforting friend. Franklin's journey had concluded, but the trails he blazed, the changes he ushered in, and the hopes he ignited would continue to shine, illuminating the path for generations to come. Chapter 10. Legacy of a Leader The sun set over the horizon, casting long shadows over the streets of Washington, D.C. The hustle and bustle of the city slowed, but inside the hallowed halls of the Library of Congress, a young researcher, Clara, sat engrossed in her work. Before her lay stacks of old newspapers, photos, and records all chronicling the era of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Clara was working on a project about the leaders who had transformed America, and FDR was at its heart. As she turned the pages, she couldn't help but marvel at the vastness of Roosevelt's impact. The New Deal, Social Security, the formation of the United Nations, these were not just policies but revolutions in their own right. Clara leaned back and imagined what life was like back then. The Great Depression had gripped the country. People lost their homes, jobs, and hope. Then came this man, Franklin, with his contagious optimism and vision. With programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration, he didn't just aim to fix the economy. He wanted to uplift the human spirit. She thought of her own grandparents, who often spoke of the Roosevelt years. They reminisced about how they found jobs because of his policies, how they felt a sense of security knowing there was a safety net if things went wrong. They spoke of him not just with respect, but with deep affection. Clara's research also highlighted Roosevelt's influence on the world stage. He was a beacon of democracy during World War II, forging strong alliances 
and championing the cause of freedom. His vision of the United Nations, where nations could discuss and resolve their differences, was groundbreaking. The more Clara read, the clearer it became that Roosevelt was not just a leader for his time, but for all times. His decisions and policies had shaped the very fabric of modern America, from how the government supports its citizens to how it interacts with the world. Feeling inspired, Clara jotted down notes for her presentation. She wanted the world to remember and appreciate the monumental legacy of FDR. His leadership was a testament to the power of resilience, vision, and unwavering commitment to the greater good. As the lights of the library began to dim, signaling closing time, Clara packed her things. Stepping out into the cool night air, she looked up at the stars Thinking of Roosevelt's words, we have always held to the hope, the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world, beyond the horizon. And thanks to leaders like him, that horizon was brighter for all. In a small town in Illinois, a group of children gathered at the local library for story hour. Today's topic was special. Heroes of the Past Mrs. Thompson a kindly librarian with silver hair and glasses had a special story to tell. Today, kids, she began with a smile. We'll talk about a hero not from a fairy tale, but from real life. His name was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Little eyes widened in curiosity. Most knew of the name, having seen it in textbooks or heard it from elders but Mrs. Thompson's storytelling made history come alive. Long ago, she began, America faced a big, big problem. People had no work, they were sad, and they lost hope. She showed them a black and white picture of long lines of people waiting for food. This was the Great Depression. A little boy, Timmy, raised his hand. It sounds really bad, Mrs. Thompson. It was, she nodded, but then came along a man who, despite his own struggles, wanted to help everyone else. She told them about how Franklin had been struck down by illness, how he couldn't walk, but he never let it defeat him. He rose to become the president and brought in new rules and programs to help people. But kids, Mrs. Thompson continued, what made him truly special wasn't just what he did but how he did it. She told them about his fireside chats, how he spoke directly to the people, making them feel heard and comforted. He made people believe in themselves again, she added, and even when the world was at war, he stood strong, guiding everyone towards peace. She showed them another picture, this one of Roosevelt with two other leaders. Here he is with Mr. Churchill and Mr. Stalin making plans for a better, peaceful world after the war. Lily, a young girl with braided hair, commented, He sounds like a superhero, Mrs. Thompson. In many ways he was, the librarian responded, but remember, he was human, just like you and me. He had his fears, his worries, but he chose to rise above them. And that's why we remember him not just for the changes he made, but for the hope he gave. After the story session, the children left the library, their minds buzzing with tales of a real-life hero. Timmy, inspired, decided he too would overcome his fears and learn to ride a bicycle. Lily wanted to read more about leaders who changed the world. In homes, schools, and libraries across the nation, The story of Franklin D. Roosevelt was told and retold. His legacy wasn't just in the policies he implemented or the war he led. It was in the hearts he touched and the future generations he inspired. The halls of the White House, usually buzzing with activity, fell silent following Franklin's passing. A sense of mourning hung in the air. People from far and wide came to pay their respects to the fallen leader. However, in the midst of this heavy sorrow, one figure emerged, poised and determined, Eleanor Roosevelt. 
Eleanor, with her tall frame and serious eyes, had been by Franklin's side throughout his journey. While many saw her as the president's wife, few realized that she was a force to be reckoned with on her own. The world would soon witness the indomitable spirit of Eleanor. In the days following Franklin's death, she received countless letters. Some expressed condolences, while others wondered about the future of America. Eleanor read each one, drawing strength from the shared memories of her beloved husband. One evening, sitting in her private chambers, Eleanor remembered a conversation she had with Franklin during one of their quiet moments. Eleanor, he had said, if anything ever happens to me, promise me you'll keep our dreams alive. And she had promised. Now, faced with a world without Franklin, Eleanor decided to act. She began traveling, visiting places Franklin had wanted to see, meeting the people he had wished to help. From coal miners in the West to farmers in the South, Eleanor listened to their stories, ensuring that Franklin's vision for a better America remained on course. But Eleanor's ambitions weren't limited to America. She believed, as did Franklin, in a united world. She began working with the newly formed United Nations, fighting for global human rights. Her efforts led to the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a landmark achievement. Many times during her speeches, people would notice the pendant she wore around her neck. It was a small flame, symbolizing the torch that Franklin had passed on to her. To Eleanor, it was a constant reminder of the promise she had made and the duty she had to fulfill. In her later years, Eleanor wrote, Franklin gave me a purpose. He made me see that every individual has the power to make a difference. And even though he's not here, his ideals, his dreams, they're very much alive in me, in all of us. Indeed, while Franklin's physical presence had faded, his spirit lived on. Through Eleanor's actions and words, the world remembered and celebrated a leader whose legacy transcended time. The torch, once held by Franklin, now shone brightly in Eleanor's hands, illuminating the path for future generations.